Um, without further ado, um, you mentioned uh, Ian McCauley, um, Marie, but there's also um, Dr. Jimmy McLaughlin from UCD, and he was the one that introduced me to radon, and that was nearly 40 years ago, uh, which is getting scary. All these anniversaries are getting a bit scary, even the young scientists, half a century. Jeepers. But um, he, he got me very enthusiastic for radon, and uh, you'll see some of his uh, stuff coming out in it. Okay, well, it um, gets very bad press. It's, I've seen it referred to as the silent killer. But I would add all of these as silent killers. In fact, I've seen carbon monoxide referred to as well. Uh, the full Irish breakfast is, is <laughs> my favourite. Um, and this one was a real silent killer. It came in the night, uh, the year before Chernobyl. Methyl isocyanate from an American plant in India killed 8,000 people, mostly women and children. And I don't hear of any Bhopal's children's charity, for example, but that was about 100 times more people died there than in Chernobyl the following year. So there are silent killers around, but I wouldn't really get too upset about any of them. I mean, a rifle bullet's a, a silent killer if it comes to that. Um, so I don't like these emotional terms, and unfortunately, everything to do with radioactivity, radiation, gets emotional, and people get scared. So what I'm going to be talking about briefly under these six headings, it looks like a lot, but don't worry, I probably will not be able to get through them all anyway. Um, just looking at various aspects of radon and finishing with some interesting areas where there's some high rate. Okay, discovery. Um, last year, somebody asked me why Marie Curie was my heroine, and I, I went on rather a bit too long <laughs> with the explanation. So I'm going to preempt it this time. But anyway, she was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize, um, and the only person ever to win two Nobel Prizes, chemistry and physics. But what's less well known is that her Radium Institute was mainly to look at the medical aspects and they had learned this early on, that fingertips were getting burned and so on. So they realized that tumors could be burned and healthy tissue would recover faster. This was called brachytherapy, where the source was put in contact with the tumor, as opposed to teletherapy, which is where beams or you know, radiation are used. And the thing that's even less well known is that during World War I, when any soldier who had a, a, a bullet or a shell fragment could die of sepsis or hemorrhage, um, she set up mobile x-ray vehicles, trained in her daughter and a couple of dozen other um, operators. Um, and they were called putties, little curies. She commandeered these vehicles from wealthy people, who were the only people that had vehicles anyway, and equipped them with a um, generator and an x-ray unit and learned how to drive. And she was driving around herself. And this is a cutaway. I found this, which was fascinating, because I would have liked to have had this last year when somebody asked me the question. But the x-ray tube was under the table, unshielded. The patient lay on top for a few minutes, whatever it took, and the operator used a fluoroscope, a bit like those things years ago, you could look at your shoes, your feet, in certain shoe shops. Probably not a good idea. <laughs> but, um, so that's, they didn't use photographic emulsion at all, just this device. But the operator was in the presence of this x-ray tube you know, for as long as they were working. The patient was only there for a few minutes. And this guy is standing at a safe distance here. So I'm pretty certain that that's what did it for Madame Curie in the end, at the age of 67, I think. <clears throat> she had um, a form of leukemia. But when her skeleton was um, exhumed for reburial in Paris in the Pantheon, her bones did not contain radium. And radium acts like calcium or barium. It would have been in her bones if it was the radium that had, had uh, affected her. So I'm pretty certain it was X-ray tubes, um, her contribution to World War I, saving thousands of lives and limbs. Because once you saw where the fragment was, a doctor could extract it. Um, so, okay, radon. You probably all know where it is on the periodic table. What used to be called the inert gases in my day are now called the noble gases. But I've blocked out a section here from uranium, which is the highest atomic number of naturally occurring, and, um, yeah, naturally occurring elements. Beyond that, I haven't... The others are there in white, but you can't see them for some reason. Um, they are sort of... Uh, the transuranic are not naturally occurring, shall we say. But anyway, the block goes from uranium to thorium to radium to radon, polonium, bismuth, lead, and you could even add in thallium and mercury. Uh, various radioactive decay chains sort of occupy this block here. But I also draw your attention to two other ones, carbon uh, and potassium. We all have in our bodies um, a fraction of a microgram, that's all, of carbon-14, the stuff that's used for radiometric dating. 
but it's, it's got a short half-life, so it's quite active. We also have about 16 milligrams of potassium-40, also in our bodies and our blood. One part in a thousand of potassium is potassium-40. So all of us are radioactive from our internal radioactive elements, carbon and potassium, to the tune of 8,000 becquerels. It's quite an interesting number because only a, a thousand, a little, well, 2,000 more, 10,000 becquerels for, say, a 100 kilo person would be the permitted amount in fish in, in Japan, for example. So, you know, we're almost not edible just on, from our <laughs> <laughs> internal radioactivity. And technetium is another one I mentioned because it gives off gamma rays that are very low energy, very like X-rays. In fact, the only difference between X-rays and gamma rays are, is, the, is where they come from. They're indistinguishable otherwise. But that's used for medical imaging. And a friend of mine recently had um, forgotten what his, his ailment was, something to do with some bleeding in the intestines or something. But they, he told me that they were giving him a gamma camera scan and that there was a sign on his door saying no pregnant women. So I tell you, I was over to the Black Rock Clinic in jig time with a Geiger counter and I never saw readings like I saw there in my life. It was right off the top end of the, the least sensitive scale. But four hours later, it was coming down. So it, it's very short lived. So highly radioactive materials have short half-lives. Okay, that's enough about that. Now, who discovered radon? This is another controversy. It's always attributed to Friedrich Dorn, a physicist, German physicist, who, as far as I can make out, just identified as an isotope. And an isotope of what? Um, it's probably more likely that it was Rutherford who discovered it. And he certainly, he's a physicist, but he got a Nobel Prize in chemistry, which is interesting. He calculated the atomic mass. And I think for anyone in chemistry, that is the sort of the, the signature tune of, a, of an element, or at least an isotope. And he obtained a spectrum. But it was challenged by this chemist, William Ramsey, who determined the density, and he classified it as a noble gas. And these two had um, lots of correspondence, very angry stuff, letters to the institution, all this sort of stuff. But Rutherford, to his credit, always said it was Marie Curie discovered radon. Um, anyway, that's, that's uh, in terms of the history. But I can't uh, pass our own John Jolie from Trinity, who within 10 years of Marie Curie's discovery had a book on radioactivity and geology. I mean, that hot off the press. Yeah? Uh, he also d discovered the RUC was twice as radioactive than the average. Uh, that was before cellophane was heard of. And also that geothermal energy is mostly radiogenic, a, a fact that's not normally bandied around by the um, geothermal people, energy people. But more importantly, he just realized that instead of using radium implants, and radium was very expensive, difficult stuff to handle, the gas coming off the radium, which was radon, uh, once you had your supply of radium, you, you milked it, as it were, for your radon, and you could use radon implants. This became known as the Dublin Method. It was Mary Mulville who, who um, sort of uh, publicized that too. So that was the time when we were sort of up there leading the world in uh, physics. Okay, so what is radioactivity exactly? And uh, here again, there's another word I don't like, decay. Radioactive decay, it sounds like something that's horrible and nasty and rotten, you know, rotten fish or something, decaying. Um, so I prefer to use the word transformation, but I'll probably end up saying decay anyway. And basically what happens is, in the nucleus, oh yeah, and just to give you an, an idea, imagine the Aviva Stadium, and out in the middle you have an orange. That's the nucleus. The electrons are out on the stand. That's the, the proportion, sort of. Um, apart from hydrogen, which only has one proton, every other element has more than one proton. These are positively charged. They repel each other. And, and, the, and they're forced into incredibly close proximity in the nucleus. It's like a giant spring that you've crushed right down to a very small size and it's just waiting to bang out again and, and blow you apart. So what keeps the protons together? Well, it turns out it's the neutrons. The neutrons are the glue. And it's called the strong nuclear force. It only works a very short distance. And, and it doesn't even allow them to come in contact with each other, apparently. Now, don't ask me that. But anyway, from hydrogen up to about calcium, you have the same number of neutrons and protons. So it's, everything is nice. But as the nucleus gets bigger and bigger, you start needing more glue. And by the time you get up to lead, you've got one and a half times as many neutrons. You've 126 neutrons, only 82 protons. And of course, it's protons that make different chemical elements. Um, the amount of neutrons determines the isotopes. That would be like the horizontal black dots there. The black dots are all what we call the stable 
nuclei. And you can see in the middle there's more of them here around where iron is. And that's because iron, um, the nucleus of iron and nickel are the strongest, what they call bonding energy, the sum total of the neutron glue, if you like. Uh, so they're the most stable, and that's why I think they're in the core of some planets, but anyway, that's, that's a different subject. So what happens if a particular atom uh, of a particular element anywhere along here has too many neutrons? If you have too many neutrons, the, the nucleus is not happy. It's, it, it's overweight. And it, it readjusts itself by converting one neutron into a proton, which changes the element into something else, goes up one on the, on the periodic table, um, and spits off a beta particle, which is actually just an electron. But it's an electron coming from the nucleus, not coming from the orbital electrons. And it's coming at high speed, and we call those beta particles. But they're just electrons, the same as traveling the wires for electricity. So that's called beta decay, and it's a method of the, the nucleus trying to shed a bit of weight and get back to something stable. And what happens if there's not enough neutrons out on the other side? There's various things can happen here. In an extreme case, you may get a proton emitted, but normally it's an alpha particle. You could have a positron, but I'm not going to go into that at the moment. An alpha particle is just two neutrons and two protons. In other words, a helium nucleus. A helium ion would be a better way. It's charged. So it spits off two neutrons and two protons simultaneously, going sort of out to the right and going down, going back towards the, the line of stability, if you like. Now, when you get up above uranium, which is up here somewhere, no amount of glue will do the job. The thing is getting just too big. So it starts falling apart, and that's what fission is. So that's all radioactivity is. It's operation transformation. It's a weight-adjusting procedure to allow the nucleus to get back to a nice ratio, a comfortable ratio of neutrons and protons by changing effectively the number of protons. And that creates a new element. So I don't call this decay. This is transformation. The alchemists were trying to transform lead into gold. Uh, they hadn't a hope, but... Um, we're seeing it every day with, with uh, radioactive materials. Maybe not the ones we particularly want to have, but that's what's happening. And the particles I mentioned, the only form of radioactivity um, or radiation that results in this transformation are alpha and beta particles. The alpha particles, two neutrons, two protons, and a double charge. So they've got mass. They're not traveling very fast. Well, 15,000 kilometers per second is sort of fast, I suppose. Uh, so these are like tank shells. They've got plenty of mass, but they're not going that fast. And they don't go very far in air, five centimetres. Sheets of paper will stop them. Beta particles are more like bullets. Um, they're travelling fast, but they've got very small mass. They're electrons, very close to the speed of light they travel at. So they go a bit further, a half a metre, a metre in air. And a sheet of plastic or two millimetres of aluminium will stop them. Now the gamma rays, which is the ones we're always worried about, they're only accompanying the act, as it were. They, they don't uh, appear with every transformation. They, they're, they're sort of a slight um, accountancy adjustment because sometimes there's a little bit of mass left over and it'll appear as, as electromagnetic radiation. So the gamma rays don't occur with every single nuclear transformation. These are more penetrating because they've no mass and they've no charge. And neutrons, which don't occur naturally, do have mass. These are rather more dangerous because they don't have a charge, um, but they're not, they don't occur naturally, so we don't really worry about them. Oddly enough, they're attenuated by low-density materials. Uh, gamma rays and X-rays are attenuated by high-density materials. But the other two are, are absorbed. The alpha particle soon meets something with a charge, a negative charge, and it's annihilated. And all these alpha particles become helium gas in the party balloons and the MRI scanners. Thanks to, part, thanks to nuclear transformation and radioactivity, we have party balloons. And I keep reminding people that don't like anything to radioactive. If you remember the Green Party, don't get a helium balloon then. You won't like it. And we can't make helium, and it's, it's actually very important for scanners, among other things. Okay, a quick look at radon itself. And when I say radon, I'm referring to the, the more common isotope, radon-222. And it's got eight electrons in the outer shell. It's an inert gas or noble gas. But those eight electrons are, are some distance out from the nucleus. And they're also shielded by all these other electrons in between. So these are rather loosely bound electrons. So radon and the formerly called inert gases will actually react chemically. And in fact, radon difluoride was synthesized in 1962. 
more as a chemical curiosity. I don't think it has any, any, any value other than that, just to prove the point. It's a noble gas, I said, and it emits alpha particles, and that's the important bit for us. There's a lot of other isotopes, most of them artificially created, um, and they're all unstable. There's a total of 200 tonnes has been estimated in the crust, and in the atmosphere, a total of 20 grams. And as I remember, one prof said there was, he said, there's more fart gas in the atmosphere than radon, <laughs> and probably more methyl isocyanate as well, for that matter. Um, now, it's no smell or taste, but I wouldn't like to be the person volunteering for that particular test. It's dense and it's soluble in water, and this is a very important property of radon. Uh, it doesn't have much of a liquid phase, only about 9 degrees centigrade. Um, in the gaseous phase, it's dense, about 8 times more than air, almost 10 grams a litre. And in the liquid phase, density about 4.3 grams per cc, to use those terms. And it's said to have a brilliant orange glow, which I'd love to see. Um, now, the thing about isotopes, I just remind everybody, they all have the same atomic number, so it's the same chemistry, more or less, not quite the same chemistry. They have different atomic weights, though, because of the different amounts of neutrons. And that gives them slightly different physical properties, like rate of diffusion and things like that. But most important is they have different, what are called, decay constants. Now, everyone is familiar with the, the terminology of half-life, but in physics, it's the decay constant. Where does that come from? That is, um, that should go off somewhere here. Yeah. yeah, it does. It's the decay constant is, I always compare it to a rate of interest in a bank. Well, that would be appreciation. A rate of depreciation would be a better comparison. Uh, it's, it's a constant rate. Everyone thinks of exponential decays as if something is changing. And of course, the word exponential, everybody thinks it means something huge and fast and happening very quickly. It's not. Exponential decay can be incredibly slow or fast. Um, but we tend to talk about decay constants, and they would be very like an interest rate, or for example, dirt tax. That's a, a, and that's a very good comparison between dirt and decay. Um, we'll see a, bit, a little bit more about that. And the energy may or may, may not be characteristic. So if you're looking at a different isotope, you will see a slightly different atomic weight and a, a different decay constant, and perhaps a different... Okay, radon and thoron. Um, Radon-222, as I said, is the common isotope, and it's got a half-life of three, almost four days, 3.8 days. And that comes from the uranium-238 chain, which we'll see in a moment. Thoron is the name given to distinguish radon-220. It's got a half-life of 55 seconds, uh, which is quite fast. So they have the name Thoron, just, just to help us remember which is which. There's another one called Actinon. It comes from uranium-235. But its half-life is only four seconds, so I, I don't bother to, to add it in because it's, it's too quick. Um, they're both, of course, the same uh, in terms of solubility, density, etc. A hundred times more soluble in water than air. And I think that's, again, a very important thing for geology. It's, radon is far more likely to travel dissolved in water than any other way. That creates a problem for sampling, as, as Javier in the audience here probably is aware of. If, if you try to sample the, the soil gas for radon, um, if, if the sample tube is in too shallow, you have atmospheric air getting in. If you try to put it too deep, there's more work involved drilling the hole, and you m may get water coming in as well, in typical Irish soils anyway. So it's tricky enough. And on top of that, it can vary with atmospheric pressure. Um, even the wind blowing over can, can vary the, the amount. And rainfall has a big effect uh, in, in two ways. It either suppresses the, the radon being released in the soil, or else it washes all the radon in the atmosphere out, right down to ground level. So the whole column right up to the cloud of radon has now sort of come right down to ground level in a layer millimetre thick. So radon can be affected by various other things. But generally speaking, in soils, the variations in the soil itself are much greater than these variations, in my experience anyway. Now, radon may diffuse as a gas up to 10 metres from the source, according to some people. I, I don't really buy this. I think it's moving in water. But Thoron, on the other hand, with a half-life 55 seconds, is not going to get very far, even if it's able to diffuse. So it's a possible indicator of soil permeability. If you're measuring radon and Thoron in the same sample, the ratio between the two may be actually telling you something about permeability. But add in the question mark anyway. Now, uh, Becquerel's, this, I, I like this diagram because um, you'll see in a moment that the unit Becquerel is now the, the preferred one, 
and I don't like it too much, I have to say. But Becquerel's would be like the number of apples falling from the tree per second. Now, it would be some tree if they're falling that fast. But you can imagine them anyway the, as particles. Now, the guy lying under, this is radiology, I should say, over this side. The guy lying under here, the tree here is hit by some of the apples. That's the absorbed dose. In, in, and you get lots of instruments nowadays that are calibrated in these two units, which is a bit of a nuisance because these are radiological units, the effect of radiation on biological tissue. So anyway, the number hitting them would be the gray, the absorbed dose. But if a big apple hits them on the head, it's a lot worse than a small crab apple hitting them on the knee. So this would be the effective dose. And these are sieverts. You've probably come across these units, sieverts. And, and we do the same in, in, um, in, in, in nuclear physics. The alpha particle, I said, was a heavy hitter because it's got two neutrons, two protons. The alpha particle would be, would be like the big apple, whereas the beta particle would be more like the crab apple. So we weight the different types of radiation for their different biological effect. And alpha particles get a weighting of 20 um, over X-rays and gamma rays, which have a weighting of 1. I've forgotten what uh, neutrons are. I think neutrons are 10. I don't know if anybody here remembers this sort of stuff. But anyway, alpha particles I'm, I'm sort of focusing in on because these are the things that we worry about when it comes to physics. Now, somebody asked me, I think it was Frank asked me, how uh, common is uranium in the... You didn't say the crust, you said something else. Now, this is a table of the abundance in the crust uh, of um, <coughs> all the, the elements. Rock-forming elements are up here. <coughs> this is normalized to silicon. It says here silicon is taken as a million, just as a reference level. So uranium is down here a thousand times less abundant than silicon, but a thousand times more abundant than gold. So it's as common as arsenic. And the other interesting thing about this is that the rare earth elements are not rare at all. It's another misnomer. It's just they don't react chemically, so it's difficult to find deposits of the rare earth elements. They, uh, and thorium is very similar to the rare earth elements. It does not form deposits readily. Uranium, though, is different. It's very mobile in one valent state, in an oxidized state. The quadrivalent version of uranium um, is, is very mobile in oxygenated groundwater. So we have to watch out because uh, it's, it's, it's in lots of things and there's lots of rain falling as well. The, incidentally, the, the really rare ones, of course, the jewellery metals, as I call them, iridium being the, the rarest. So I said uranium is in lots of things, more commonly in the felsic rocks than in the basic rocks. But nevertheless, it's there in, in all of them, as is thorium in slightly greater abundance. And I also add in potassium here because it's the other commonly occurring um, radio element that we have in rocks. <coughs> and it's the uranium in crude oil in some deposits where it was reduced, of course, by the carbon that from the, um, what do you call it, the, the plants so they, or the, the creatures it, that make up petroleum. I'm not good on petroleum geology, obviously. Um, but this is where helium comes from. Some petroleum wells in Texas uh, emit lots of helium, dead alpha particles. And one gram per tonne is one part per million. Just about. So uranium is all around the place. So is thorium. So we look at the two particular chains. And without going into too much detail, thorium-232 has a half-life of 14 billion years. But all of the daughter products, um, of, they're called progeny nowadays. But what's one of them? I was asking this question here. Is it a progene? Because daughter products sound sexist, you <laughs> see. But it's still a handy word, even down here it's radon daughters. Yeah? Um, all of them, if you look quickly down, six hours, 1.9 years, 3.6 days, 50, 50, that's Thoron, by the way, there, 55 seconds, minutes, hours, etc. They're all short-lived, so we really don't worry about thorium. And in any way, as I said, it's, it's rather immobile um, chemically in the crust. Uranium, on the other hand, shorter half-life, still 4.5 billion years, the life of the Earth, more or less. So half of the original uranium is still there. Um, apart from these two here, the next one is U234, quarter of a million years, thorium 230, 80,000 years, even radium 226, 1,600 years, whereas the radium 224 is only 3.6 days. So these are all relatively long-lived um, isotopes, or radionuclides, I suppose. But from here on, from radon down, you're looking at minutes, days, OK, there's a 22 years in there, but these are all relatively short, but not as short as the thorium. So these do hang about for the sort of times that matter for, for human existence, I suppose. 
is one way of putting it. Um, yeah, so we're going to look at just radon 220 and radon 222. But these daughter products enter the, the, the picture. And what happens is if you chemically separated uranium or if it's somehow been separated in groundwater, what happens? Well, the U234 and the U238 are both together. They're both chemically the same, more or less, forms of uranium. So the two together will be there if you've separated chemically or by um, erosion or whatever. And there'll be an activity of about 25 kilobecquerels per gram, I think. After about um, less than a year, a few months, the first two daughter products, the thorium and the proactinium, start building up. And then nothing much happens for about 3,000 years. But the radioactivity has doubled, you notice. Up, it's up to 50 now. Around 3,000 years, you start noticing that the other daughter products are beginning to build up. And eventually, after a million years has elapsed, you're back to square one. All the ducks are in a row again. They all have the same activities. That's why they all have the same width on the bar. But they're different half-lives, so they're not present in equal quantities, but they have equal activities. Uh, and you've got about seven times the radioactivity of the initial uranium. And yet there's only 0.02% has actually been used up of the parent. And this then continues on into billions of years, by which time you're, the parent is now beginning to get used up. After a billion years, you've only got 85% of the original U238, and everything else is declining as the parent declines. And the point about this is, if m uranium is mobile in the near surface of the Earth, in soils and rocks, it takes a million years for the whole lot to get back in, in, into sort of the natural uh, assemblage. And the Ice Age was only, what, 12,000 years ago. So a million years is quite a long time to, to be expecting everything to stay in this equilibrium. And the reason that's important is because if we look at the decay chain again of U238, just laid out a different way, it's only when you get down to radon that things start happening. <coughs> These are all alpha decays and rather slow until you get to radium, of course. Radon is a gas, so it can move out of this chain. Uranium, as I said, is chemically mobile. It can also get out of the chain. Even radium is slightly mobile. But it's after radon, you have one alpha particle emitted, and you get polonium-218. It, in turn, is transformed with another alpha particle, and then there's two beta emitters down to polonium-214, and then one more alpha particle. So radon gives rise to three alpha particles, its own alpha particle, plus two more down the line. And then here, there's a bit of a... Um, hiatus, there's lead 210 has a long, longer half-life, 22 years. So there's a bit of an interruption here. And then eventually there's another series of decays with another alpha, finally to lead 206. But it's this one here, this bismuth 214, is, uh, emits gamma rays of a very distinctive energy. It's, it's like the sodium lights on the street. The yellow light tells you it's sodium. Um, this energy level of gamma radiation tells you it's bismuth 214. This is the gamma signal that's used to detect uranium. But it's not uranium itself. It, it's all the way back to, to uranium over here. So it's, we call it equivalent uranium. And this is what the TELUS survey is also detecting. So when they tell you they're detecting uranium, they're not. They're detecting bismuth 214. So we now have three actors in the story. We have mobile uranium. We have very mobile gas, radon. And now we have another element, a metal, bismuth 214, giving gamma radiation. So it's a, a tall order to say that they're all in the same place. Um, and when we make measurements, there's another thing too. We're only measuring the top few centimetres. Gamma rays are absorbed or attenuated by soils. So even with the airborne survey, you're not looking deeper than a metre, half a metre, in fact, most of the time. So we're only looking at the topmost layer which is the layer that is most affected by oxygenated rainwater, which makes uranium mobile. And we're assu still assuming that everything is in equilibrium, even though we know it takes a million years to get back to equilibrium. And in fact, that's the peak. This, this is the peak here on a spectrum. That would be um, potassium, but that is potassium. This one here is always called the uranium peak that's detected by the spectrometers. But you see in brackets here, it's this one, two and four. And the so-called thorium peak is actually thallium-208. So these are only really proxies. We're not measuring uranium or thorium at all when we do these airborne surveys or ground surveys. OK, now to soil gas. So here's a sort of a cartoon 
It doesn't look very geological, but it gives the idea. Uranium can be depleted out of the soil by oxygenated rain or groundwater. So it can be transported downwards. Groundwater usually goes downwards at some point, comes up again somewhere else. Radon is a gas, so it may be heading for the surface or it may be heading somewhere else, dissolved in, in water. And then finally, it has to deposit its daughter products, including the bismuth 2 and 4, possibly somewhere else. So we have uranium, radon, and bismuth 2 and 4, all in possibly different places. But we always assume they're in the one place. Um, I just mentioned this one again, uh, just to remind you that there's a gap between the first lot of daughter products and the second. So what happens? with radon. Suppose you strip out radon, you suck it up in the tube from the ground as a gas. So it's now separated from the uranium and the, all the radium, it, it, that was the immediate precursor. So what happens to it itself? Well immediately it, it's decaying by alpha decay into polonium. So here comes number two alpha particle. Then we have the beta decays I mentioned with the gamma radiation, including the bismuth 2 and 4 in this purpley colour. And then finally, there's one more, the third alpha particle. And this takes about three hours. Now, you see here we're looking at 5,000 as opposed to 1,000. But here we're counting the activity of the two beta emitters. But if you just count the alpha emitters, there's only three of them. And basically what happens is after about three hours, you have three times the, the alpha particle emission. So the radon, the alpha activity builds up after you've taken your sample, up to a peak. Um, after about three hours, and then it starts decaying as the parent is beginning. That's an exponential decay, incidentally. It doesn't look like it, because that's a logarithmic scale. You always have to watch the scales on graphs. You can, you can make any graph look like anything you want by changing the two scales. Um, and people do this all the time in the newspapers with economic figures. Um, the other point is that after about a week, you're back down here at the level you started at, and after about a month, and it was Mar Marie Curie noticed that this emanation, she didn't give it a name, she said it was active for about 40 days. So it clearly was radon. So we get to polonium 210, and there's a, a bit of a, a delay, a 22 year delay. And then eventually that starts decaying by beta decay to the last alpha emitter, which is the polonium 210, and that decays into lead. And this ha these have longer lives because the 22 years is slowing everything down to a sort of a human time scale. So I would suggest, and this peaks around a year, but it lasts for up to what, 10, 20, 30, 100 years perhaps. I would suggest that it's the polonium 210 that ends up in our lungs. When you breathe in radon gas, it's not the gas that's the problem, it's the daughter products because they're metallic particles. Radon's a gas, but, the, but everything after that is a, is a solid and they're charged particles. They end up sticking in people's lungs, giving off alpha particles. Now, alpha particles, as I said, are absorbed by even a sheet of paper. So if an alpha emitter gets inside your body somewhere, the alpha particles it emits probably don't get further than a millimeter, but they're all in that area, sort of banging away for 10, 20, 30 years. And I reckon that's where the problem is with radon. Um, anyway, how do we measure radon? I don't know if any schools have these things anymore, gold leaf electroscopes. Marie Curie probably used one. Um, she also used an ionization chamber that her husband, who was a physicist, had, had sort of developed. I, I don't know how they worked in those days. It's, it's quite amazing what was done with equipment from that era. I, 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 I'm absolutely bowled over by what was done in the past. And nowadays we can't do anything without a laptop and a Geiger counter. We can't make anything anymore. I prefer these sort of detectors here. Here's this thing again. Good. This is called a Lucas cell, and it was Prof. McLaughlin introduced me to these. It's just a container, a cup, if you like, with a glass window. Now, there's another way of doing it, and this is um, the sort of equipment that the Earth Science Department and TCD have, and the EPA. Uh, a device called a Durridge, the RAD7. It even has a little printer on it, very nice piece of kit. My problem with this is um, that it can only make one measurement at a time. So you have to have a few of these if you want to have any productivity. But it's fine for indoor work. And it, it can tell the difference in the alpha particle energy. So it's an alpha particle spectrometer. 
So you can tell the difference, you can tell the origin of the, of the alpha particles. Was it radon 220 or radon 222? That's a drying tube, as Javier probably uh, knows. Uh, this is one I like. It's, it's uh, made in Canada called a pylon. They used to have these in the EPA. And this is a Lucas cell, a rather nice one, made of aluminium with two valves for letting the air in and out. The advantage of this is you can collect several samples if you have a, a bunch of these uh, Lucas cells. And you can bring them back to this device. Or you can bring this device out in the field. So you can increase your productivity. And there's a little pump inside and two, an inlet and an outlet. So you pump the sample. This is the instrument I think you have in Trinity, Javier. This is um, an ionization chamber, a sort of a modern version of what Marie Curie's husband might have concocted. Um, but you can make your own. And there's plenty of things on the web, uh, people making these. Out. I, I've made one out of a grapefruit can, which worked very well. Uh, this one's even calibrated, a nice wooden plate as well, isn't it? This is a rather flashy one, this. And a handful of transistors. If you're handy with a solenoid iron, you can make one of those things. This is another one for less than 10 quid. And in all the years I've been to the Young Scientist competition, do you think anybody has made anything themselves like this? I, I've yet to see it. Um, this is the most expensive part, but you buy an Aldi for about 7 or 8 euros. And the rest is just a tin can and about one, one euro's worth of transistors. And like I say, you have to be handy with the soldering iron. Here he's holding um, the little alpha source from a, a smoke detector with the tweezers into the open end of this to get some alpha particles. It's an americium source they put in smoke detectors. Ten quid. This is my own equipment. Um, it's a bit more elaborate. Um, there's a photomultiplier in here. And this is one of Prof McLaughlin's... Um, Heinz salad cream jars that were converted into Lucas cell. Uh, and he was making these. He, and these are 40 years old now. They still work perfectly well. That's a light proof box with the photomultipliers. You open the door at the end and put this thing in. High voltage supply for the photomultiplier. It needs about 1,000 volts. And then I feed the signal into a thing called a, a gate. It's a timer. It just lets pulses go through for a minute or five minutes or whatever you set on the, the little dial here into an off the shelf counter. Pulse counter, it's just a standard electronic um, counting device. Notebook and pencil, and you're, you're good to go right on. This is the equipment in the field. I have one pylon cell, just to make sure I have a, a sort of one that can be stood over for quality control. But I did check these against the EPA, and the calibration is fine, including Jim McLaughlin's um, salad cream jars. Maybe I should say mayonnaise, shouldn't I? Mm -hmm. um, and this is just a little pump here. And instead of the uh, drying column, I just use a motorbike fuel filter. Works very well. You know, there's ways of doing things. Now, how do I cal not calibrate, but how do I check this is working? Well, this is one way. Does anybody know what a gas mantle is? Yeah. yeah. If you've been camping, you probably would have heard of them. Now, these come from China, um, and they used to be the ones in Europe used to be thoriated, but the European Union thinks we're too delicate. We can't have thorium, so now they have yttrium instead. But the, the guy who sold these to a friend of mine in China. Uh, the guy in the hardware shop said, don't keep these in your house, <laughs> which I thought was good advice. But the idea is you put them into the gas lamp, for anyone who doesn't know what a gas mantle is. And the cotton, it's, it's just a thing made of cotton. It's like a lacy sort of gadget. Uh, it, the cotton burns off and leaves a filament of oxides of mostly calcium plus this thorium and yttrium. It gives off brilliant white light, so you get more light output. Instead of a flickering yellow flame, you get a nice white light. There's a piece of apparatus you can buy in England. A lot of English schools, British schools, I should say, have these. Cost 250 quid, though. And if you look carefully, you'll see there's a thorium mantle in here. It's a plastic bottle. And there's a little bu rubber balloon on the other end. What's that for? I hear anyone say. Well, the idea is you squeeze this thoron cow, as it's called. You send a little puff of thorium, or thoron, I should say, into this ionization chamber. And the, and the rubber balloon is just to stop it coming out the other end in case students complain to their parents that they've been poisoned or something. And you feed the output from this into a laptop. And you get a lovely exponential decay curve. That's five minutes, by the way. Beautiful experiment. Really convince the school kids of you know, how things work. I wonder, has any school in Ireland got one of these? I'd, I'd almost bet money that they don't. It's a terrible thing to say. And this really annoys me, the way uh, we're being st steered by certain people away from doing science. Now, I mentioned earlier on decay constant, and you probably all know what a half-life is, and this is the relationship. The half-life is simply the log, the natural log of two 
divided by the decay constant. 0.693 roughly divided by the decay constant. And I mention this because this comes up in economics textbooks. It's called the rule of 69. So if, if house prices are going up at 6% per annum, how long will it take for them to double? And the answer you can tell in a flash, 12 years roughly. So how do you do that? You divide 6 into 69, or 72, it's easier actually, and you won't be far out. And it's simply the doubling rule. It's just exponential decay. It's just a function of maths. Or if, if the population is growing at 2% per annum, well, then it's going to be uh, roughly 35 years before it doubles. And economists love this, and people wonder how you did it. But here it is um, in, in formula form. Um, now, if you use a, a logarithmic scale, you get a straight line. An exponential will give itself away by, if that's a semi-log plot, logarithmic here and linear here, you get a straight line. I did this myself. You can see the date, 3rd of December. I also had nothing to do in December. A very nice fit using Excel. So I got my 0.0126. These are in seconds. And I just divide that into 0.693, and I get 55 seconds. The value is 54.5, published for radon. And you really feel, hey, I've just proved that this is an isotope yeah, at home while watching TV. So here we are out in, in the desert, and I have to say the Mauritanian regolith was the most perfect medium for sampling radon in. Just perfect. You could drill into it. There was enough fine material in it to seal the top of the hole so that atmospheric air didn't go in. And there's no water, of course. Uh, it's about, it, it varies. We were only sampling when this got to more than 50 centimeters thick. You go with a, a gamma instrument, there's no signal. You've got uranium underneath. You can measure nothing on the surface. It's just absorbed. But the radon works. So um, this the team here. We trained this guy in to use a compass and pacing. He was the driller. And the two geologists here were being trained in to use the instrument. And in case the pump uh, didn't work, we had a little uh, manual stirrup pump type thing. Um, and this worked very well. They have a GPS, so they can verify the position. And here's our sampler here, um, who also doubled up as tea maker. And one of the areas we looked at, uh, we got this result. This is early on. There was much more done than this. But the point here is that in, and these are 100 meter um, intervals here, so that's a 100 meter grid. In little more than 100 meters, you go from 300 to nearly 10,000. Radon is a very localized thing. It varies quite rapidly over short distances. And John Pine brought me in this detector that we had back in the, the late 70s, early 80s, which had a film inside this for detecting alpha particles. And we had to bury these and then go back a month later and hope to find them again. Um, but the point was, we, we did measurements on with very short intervals and found huge variations over relatively short distances. So radon is something very localized. And here we are in, Sp in Sweden, and we don't have a nice uh, um, petrol engine drill. We have a, the old hammer. That's myself. And the, this, these are steel tubes, thick-walled hydraulic tubing. And the, we, we sort of inserted them through a wooden cylinder just so we'd have something to grip to pull the thing back out of the ground with. Soil here is quite different, not like Mauritania. And here we have an anomaly, high readings over here. The red were the first readings, and we went back and repeated them. That's the blue. They don't repeat too well, because we're not in quite the same place. But they are repeating to some degree, where there was a high red value, there's a high blue one nearby. But look at the distance. In, again, 100 meter grid. In less than 200 meters, you go from 30 up to 400. So radon is very much a point thing. You really have to get down to the local scale. It, it's not sort of a thing you can average over a large area, as far as I can. Which brings us to the indoor stuff. Now there was a, a how are we for time? We're, okay, we're coming to the end anyway. Um, there was a, an alchemist, I think he was, or a philosopher, Paracelsus, who called it mala metallorum, the metal, metal disease. His real name was Philippus Aureolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohen. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they should have called him Pat, P-A-T, or, or Fred or something. <laughs> Even Paracelsus was a short name. Yeah? And then there was the famous geologist or mining engineer, Georg Agricola. Uh, same, same sort of time frame. Bergsucht, he called it. I think, is that mount, uh, mountain sickness? Would that be right? Mountain sickness. Mountain sickness, okay. In the 40s and 50s, um, 
and before, um, the US government was mining uranium, of course, for the atomic bomb project. And as all white Americans had been conscripted, um, it was the Navajo Indians who tended to be the, the miners. And of course, they invented, well, not they themselves, but they, their tribes, so we say, invented tobacco, so they were all chain smokers. So there was a big dispute as to whether it was the raid on or the tobacco that was <coughs> giving them problems. And the uranium companies blamed the tobacco companies, and the tobacco companies blamed the uranium companies. And it's now considered that both are responsible and that mm. the presence of both together is aggravating, makes it even worse. And in fact, it's extrapolation from this sort of data that leads us to the, the, the levels that are now considered safe or whatever. But I'm not, going, I'm not going into that because epidemiology is not a, a topic of mine and there's some iffy things in the statistics anyway. So I'm not going to say any more about that. Um, but there was a guy called Stanley Watrous. He was an engineer in the nuclear power station in Pennsylvania. And in 1984, the year before the uh, Chernobyl disaster and the same year as the Bhopal disaster, going into work, not like Homer Simpson coming out of work with plutonium in his pocket, going into work, he set off the alarms. They called these portal monitors to detect in case Homer Simpson is going out with something. Um, he was detected going in. And after a bit of investigation, they discovered his house had um, 100,000 becquerels. And the limit here, the limit is not the right word, they call it the action level or something vague like that. There's 200 becquerels. So he was uh, more like 500 times. The American level, incidentally, is set a bit lower, so that's why I have 700 times. So they traced back to his house, and this is what sort of set the ball rolling on, on looking at radon in, in the homes. But it was known in Sweden that breeze blocks in construction made of alum shale, which is a Cambrian shale, black shale, which contains a um, small amount of a hydrocarbon called kerogen, and people would burn it. And the alum was used for, for tanning leather. But the ash that was left over was quite handy for making blocks, except that it contains about 200 parts per million uranium. And so the houses, and I think this is where Jim McLaughlin comes into the picture. That was about the time, I think he did some work in, in um, Sweden, if I'm not mistaken. So it's estimated now that the 200 cases a year of lung cancers in Ireland could be attributed to, to radon, which is only about a third of the number of suicides, if you think about it. And given the resources that go into radon, you'd wonder you know, about proportions and public health and so on. Anyway, um, I mentioned Becquerels, and a Becquerel is one disintegration a second, named after Henri Becquerel, a man. But the other unit, the older unit, was the Curie, named after a woman, Mary Curie, although she always said it was her husband, but I think she was just being modest. But the Curie was defined as the activity one gram of radium. Now, I agree this is a rather uh, unsatisfactory standard because very few people have a gram of radium. And anyway, it's, it's disintegrating, it's transforming itself. It's not a constant amount. And it's also dangerous and difficult to handle. So I can see why the Becquerel has been preferred, but it, it goes the other way. It's too small a unit almost. But I can see why. And it's also a disintegration a second. It doesn't really, it's not really anything. It's just something every second. It's, it's to my mind, it's a bit unsatisfactory, but anyway. So it's, the equivalence is one curie is a prox, because you can't even do this accurately, 37 billion Becquerels. So the, the number 37 sort of comes up in a lot of things. Um, and a curie, I like a curie because it's a gram of radium. You can relate it to chemistry in soils. Becquerel is just a physical measurement in a way. It doesn't lend itself to sort of visualizing something. That's equivalent in turn to 3.3 tons of uranium. And that tells us why to get uh, less than a milligram of radium, Marie Curie needed 10 tons of, of uranium residue, pitch blend residue, or about two thirds of a cc of radon. They all have the same activity. That's, that's a Curie. These are units of activity. Um, so we tend to use a picocurie, which is one million millionth of a curie. And Americans use picocuries, Europeans use becquerels, just like feet and Fahrenheit and all these other units. Strange how these things uh, evolve. So working it all out, a picocurie per litre turns out to be about almost 40 becquerels per cubic metre. Now the safe level in America is four picocuries per litre. These are obviously round numbers for convenience, because four of these would actually be only about 160 so the American safe level or action level is actually a little bit more conservative than the, the European. Now this is a diagram I particularly like because um, 
It's, I think it comes from the American EPA because it shows houses here and their radon risk. But the one on granite is only at low radon potential. The one on the fault zone and the one on the karst, um, they're considered high radon potential. And the one on the limestone is medium. And I would contend that that is more or less what we, we find as we look at it. I should say there's some other uh, radon detectors around. Um, and I, I wouldn't like to guess the price of this one. It comes in a nice suitcase with a memory stick and a USB cable. That, to me, s tells you it's expensive. Lovely ca the handle on the case. Made in Norway. Corentium, I think it's called. Three levels. Three, you know, the cheapy one and the expensive one. Uh, Americans go for this sort of thing because they have basements and houses. And you can tell it's American because Pico Curious per liter. And even liter. Look at the way it's spelt there, like T E R. It has to be plugged in. They put these in basements and it gives an audible alarm. But the EPA in Ireland go for um, this type of device, which has a film, the same type of polyester film that's in, that was in these detectors, which were just plastic tumblers. You can see the film stuck on the side there. Um, and it's, it's developed by, expo by um, immersing it in sodium hydroxide. And the, the tracks left by the alpha particle damage in the polymer are then enlarged by the sodium hydroxide. And you can count them under a microscope. Or I think it can be done automatically. So what about the numbers? Um, what, and I've, I've just switched to Becquerel's here just for convenience, for comparison. Over the oceans, pretty well nothing. Uh, generally, over land masses, somewhat more, 10 to 30 Becquerel's per cubic meter. Soils, you just multiply them all by 100, and you're pretty well close. Houses can, can range from very low to somewhat high, as we see down here in Castle Island. Um, however, if you're in Canada, uh, the atmosphere seems to have more radon. The 60 becquerels per cubic meter, a typical atmosphere in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, which is greater than the average US indoor level. That's interesting. Mines are regulated. They must have less than 20,000, which would be high level even for a uh, uh, uranium or, or a nuclear worker, shall we say. There are also radon spas still around, believe it or not. In the Czech Republic, in the US, in Switzerland, people pay big money to go to these things. And these are the sort of levels. Typical of soils, you're really just in the ground. And an unventilated uranium mine, you could have a million. So you want to be careful going into abandoned uranium mines. Now, why are we interested in radon anyway, apart from the lung cancer problem? Radon makes up about half of the radiation we're submitted to annually, which is in Ireland is about four millisieverts a year, which is actually a little bit on the high side for Europe, oddly enough. And all the other things, the um, medical x-rays, the uh, nuclear medicine, that would be if you're getting treatment. Um, whereas, oh yeah, the internal. Here's our internal carbon-14 and potassium-40. We're ir irradiating ourselves internally, um, plus cosmic and terrestrial coming off the ground. And I don't know what the consumer products would be apart from smoke detectors. And this is Europe. So this, we're now switching to just the background radiation, millisieverts a year, keeping in mind that most of it is coming from radon. And it's quite strange how Britain is quite low. And I was talking to Javier earlier on, parts of uh, sort of um, the Hercinian granite province of Spain and parts of, of uh, Finland have rather high levels, which is interesting, up to 10. So we've got a range. Not necessarily correlated with granites. This one does, but you've granites in Brittany and they don't seem to come up that high. So it's an interesting... But put in a world context, it sort of pales a bit because in some place like Norway, the, the, the figures in brackets are the upper end that you might have locally and the other number is the average. So you may have highish values even in Norway and elsewhere else in the world. But look at these places here. One in... Brazil, I think it's a beach that people go to, in fact. Uh, I think there is Zircon or so there's something about that beach. I've forgotten what it is. Uh, I, I know about Corral. I don't know about this place here. Ramsar leads the way in Iran. Uh, the background radiation levels at Ramsar are very high. Um, and lots of people go there to study. Uh, and I'll, I'll come to it just shortly. But just remember that Ramsar is the most radioactive place naturally occurring on Earth. So here's the risk map. And we see that it's not the granites so much as this area up here, for example, Sligo, Galway, Mayo, parts of Clare, and so on, and Carlingford, where uh, Javier was working. 
So what's going on? And if you look at England, you'll see granites down here. Yeah, this is the radon risk now I'm talking about. Um, most of, of uh, Wales is slate, and, th and this is limestone up here. Scotland now, these are granites, all right, but there's lots more granites. So sort of selective, this map. But when you look at the one of the states, you really see the, the, what's going on. The high uranium concentrations are all in the west and in the east, um, and some here in, in um, is that Ohio? I, I'm not so good on my geography in North America. Is that the Ohio there, just south of the Great Lakes? Not too sure. Anyway. Uh, California, New Mexico, Arizona, Idaho, I suppose Montana would be the Colorado. But look where the highest radon risk is. It's in uh, North and South Dakota and um, what's uh, Nebraska. Yeah, I can never remember these things. I would have said NB for Nebraska. It's NE apparently. So it's clearly not correlating to uranium. And much as we'd like to link radon to uranium, it, it doesn't stand up. Yeah, some of it does, but a lot of it doesn't. And that, this observation. Look at Canada. There's hardly any place that is safe. <laughs> no wonder the atmosphere over Canada had this high level of, of radon in the atmosphere. Yeah, nearly everywhere is zone one high. So coming back to Ireland, somebody has sort of singled out counties for particular attention. Sligo, Galway, Tipperary, Waterford, Kerry, Carlow and Wexford. And, and Louth, County Louth, of course. So what's going on? Well, some areas have been looked at in the past. Um, this was done in 1992, I think. Uh, the, the sort of all the big guns came out blazing here. Geological Survey Trinity, NUIG, that should be. Sorry about that. Left off the G. My Cullen, it's near um, Loch Corrib. Now, this place in County Wicklow, I'm familiar with. Um, it's near Tullow. I would call it Rath, but the locals say Ra, <laughs> with the Wicklow accent, Ra. This was found by a French company looking for uranium back in the late 70s, a company called Moore. Uh, at the same time, we were looking, when I worked with Irish Space Metals, uh, in, in, at the basal old red sandstone in uh, County Kilkenny and Carlow, a place called Bohor Kyle, another place called Shkak Vastin. It's one of those names, once you get your tongue around it, you, you don't forget. I see I'm running out of time, so I'll be quick. Stop that thing. Um, okay, Castle Island you've heard about, and two other towns. I've mentioned Ramsar already, and we just have a very quick look at these. Here's Moy Cullen. Not in the highest risk area, uh, and these are the levels they get. Not particularly high for soils, they are high-ish. Rather low even for the indoor ones. Um, and they were looking at a fault between granite and limestone. Uh, and, and I read the report and it's sort of a bit ambiguous at the end. There was no obvious conclusion as far as I could see. I'll read it again though. This is Ra. There's actually um, a garden centre. It's about six, seven or eight kilometres east of Tullow. <coughs> There's a nice garden centre there. It's in an area of low radon risk, according to the EPA. Highest readings I've ever seen, 700,000 becquerels, getting close to an unventilated uranium mine, which it almost is. There's 30 tonnes of uranium there in the bog. Not in the granite underneath. There's nothing. They investigated that. Couldn't find the source. So that's an interesting one. The locals call it the uranium or the radium bog, I think they call it something like that, because the civil defense will test out their equipment. That's me there taking some radon samples. And then there's um, Bohor Kyle, which is sort of um, on the borders of Kilkenny, Carlow. And again, not in a particularly high area. It's high-ish. It's certainly not the highest rating. Um, and here we, we sort of mapped out radon. Very, you can see sort of contours. This isn't the pre-computer contouring era, hand-drawn contours. But we were getting water seepages. You see the word spring. So I come back to this association of radon and water movements. And this is where Dr. Javier Elio has been working. Again, similar set of results for soils. Um, and then the last area, Castle Island, where the highest indoor was, again, is not in the highest risk area. So the risk is a little bit disconnected from what we actually measure in the soil. And then this spa town, this word spa is another one that keeps coming up. This is halfway between, um, where would it be? Uh, between Sofia and um, Belgrade, I guess, halfway between the two places. And incidentally, they use the coordinates in, in geographicals, which is rather interesting, but the, um, bar there gives you a half a kilometre and you can see that in a very short distance between two sampling points not even 500 metres apart 
you go from about 30,000 to 150,000. Now these people also looked at the correlation between the soils and the houses immediately on top of them. And they see a correlation roughly 100 times higher in the soils or 100 times less in the houses, if you like to put it that way. So radon in houses is clearly something in the soils close by. Uh, here's another type of spa. You pay big money for this, <coughs> I would guess. Radon Spa Club, would you believe? And this is obviously a, a disactivated mine for something. And here's a book. I'm not sure if this is the same place. I think this one actually is in Austria or Switzerland. But there was a book, Radiation Risk and the Radon Spa, here's the word spa again, of Yakimov. Yakimov, incidentally, is Joachimstal, I think, in the Czech Republic, where Marie Curie got her pitch blend from. So it's a strange closing of the circle. Spa. What are spas? Water comes out of the ground, usually hot, as it does in Ramsar. Beautiful town. I'd love to visit this place. It's on the, the Caspian Sea, and Iranians go there for their holidays, and they camp, and they caravan, just like <coughs> anywhere else, except the women have veils. That's about the only way you'd tell the difference. But beautiful town, gardens, parks, old, old worldly sort of hotels, and all that sort of stuff. It's been studied to death by people from all over the world, including Iranians. And this would be a typical paper, risk of the natural radioactivity in the environment. Radon is coming out of the groundwater, precipitating in chalcedony and, and aragonite deposits around the springs. So there's radon all over the place. And there's obviously a source of uranium somewhere not too far away and below. And this is the conclusion of one of these papers. Now these levels are not all that high, actually. Up to, we've seen higher in Castle Island by a factor of 10 or more. Um, and says so the people and their ancestors were exposed to abnormally high radiation levels over many generations. If a radiation dose of 100 millisieverts per year is detrimental to health, it should be evident in these people. That's a rhetorical statement, and I won't comment on that. So I just conclude by saying that radon in houses is clearly related to radon in soils in the immediate vicinity, not the rocks, the soils. Radium is the immediate precursor of radon, not uranium because uh, uranium is mobile. So if we want to look at anything, it's ra radium, perhaps, we might look at. But uranium itself and radon are both mobile, so they don't necessarily coexist. So my question would be, is radon risk really correlated to uranium? And remember, the surveys like to tell us are not measuring uranium, they're measuring bismuth 214, which is the proxy, and we call it equivalent uranium. So I think we need to study the movement of radon in soils and groundwater, groundwater particularly, as well as the mechanism of entry into houses. And the last point I make, coming back to those um, grapefruit cans, the equipment can be constructed for less than 10 quid if you really want to do it. It could be a school project. And, and yet, I bet no one would even encourage it in any of the schools in this country. And, and uh, I, I find that really sad, that we seem to be turning our back on basic science. We can't do anything without a laptop. But, you know, for 10 quid and, and a grapefruit can, you can be measuring radon. <laughs> okay, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, I meant to do your thing there. So I probably went way over the time. We're still figuring this out here at the survey. Hey, while that's going on... Press escape. I think you probably...